We bring the news. Bring the action. We bring it live. This is 101.9 Chi FM. Good morning and welcome to the Cabana Show, Body, Mind and Soul of Imuna. And we are live again from Svat, all the way from Svat, Israel. And it is so good to have you with us on board. And uh, I'm privileged again to have Rabbi Alon Anava as my co-host slash guest. And we um, just uh, again a little bit about Rabbi Alon Anava. Um, he had an incredible near-death experience. It's almost how long ago? It's, fifteen years it's, ago. It's now fifteen years ago. And uh, it's just do yourself the biggest favor and to go to his website, um, alonanava dot uh, dot com, and there's also a website www alonanava dot com, and you will see a one-hour version, a two-hour version, and many many questions that listeners, followers have posed to Alon. And well, he can answer anything, and to, he um, receives a lot of emails, thousands of emails a day. So this morning we are the um, the uh, we are the ninth of seven in the year five seven seven six, and we are the fifteenth of June, twenty sixteen, and we are a couple of days just after Shavuos. So for us, it's it was ended Sunday night here in Eretz Israel, and uh, for everybody else, it ended on Monday night. So that was a very, very strange experience for me. I must, I must admit, I was kind of waiting for for more, another but, but uh, I just had to make do with with whatever it is I received and to actually digest that. And I suppose it's part of the the transition in uh, coming to Eretz Israel. There's the, there just is so much, not only physically, but as I always say, spiritually. So this morning, welcome, Alon, and thank you thank so you. much for uh, for um, being my wingman, being my co-host, and for for doing most of the talking in in terms of the shows that we've been doing together. You know, I just feel that you have so much to offer in terms of the the listeners just love to hear from you, to hear about you, to um, and again, if there's any questions, uh, we have access to the SMS line here in Israel, and if you just uh, at one rand fifty, uh, an SMS at three four five one nine. And uh, the, e the emails are free, so if you, you're welcome to SMS us on on air at chayfm.com. And also, some last week somebody phoned in on the 074 654 7335 number if there's any questions. So, last week we spoke, uh, we were, were um, asking about why am I Jewish? And we were asking, um, why am I alive? And then I did pose a question to the listeners, what is meaningful to one's life? And um, I suppose that uh, people had a lot of chance to, to really think about that over first. However, uh, if anybody wants to answer those questions or to answer that particular question on what is meaningful to you in your life, Please, free, please feel free to SMS us. So this morning, Alon, um, we've spoken about this a number of times in going into a little bit of the history of the, the Kabbalistic aspects of Svat. And you have a wealth of knowledge and information and experience in the time that you've been here and, of course, in your rabbinical studies. So welcome and good morning. Good morning, good morning. I wanted first to add one thing about what you said regarding to the holiday of Shavuot. You said that you were expecting another day. 
uh, you know, besides the fact that we celebrate two days in the diaspora because of the original uh, way that they didn't, they weren't certain about the, which day is the head of the month. Yes. We're going to see very soon a very interesting connection to the city of Tzfat about that. But uh, it started because the way they used to set up the, the head of the month was according to the moon. And we're going to talk about it in a second because Tzfat has a big connection to that. But they used to send out people and wait for witnesses to come to the courthouse and testify that they saw the moon. And once two witnesses, kosher witnesses, would come and testify that they saw the moon, then the Beit Din, the court, at the time would say, okay, today is Rosh Chodesh, and then they would have two weeks to let everybody know. And it says that it took them about two weeks for the messengers to, to go across Israel and outside of Israel to let everybody know that the Beit Din, the courthouse, decided that Rosh Chodesh would be, you know, whatever day it was. And according to that, they knew how to celebrate the, the, the festivals. The problem became that when people used to live very, very far away from Yerushalayim, and it took the messengers much more than two weeks to get there, sometimes three weeks, sometimes four weeks, so they would celebrate two days. One would be certain, and one would be uh, just in case. So it's much more to it. I don't want to waste our time on that. But that's how it started, the fact that we celebrated outside of Israel two days of the festival versus in Israel, that is one day. The mystical explanation to that is because Israel spiritually is ten times higher than, than anywhere in the world. Bechlal, we know that the world is called Olam Asiya, the world of Asiya. And Israel is the only land in the world that is considered Olam Yetzirah. These are for them four uh, uh, spiritual worlds. We also know that when the, there was the flood, so there, there's, uh, there's a story in the Torah talking about Nimrod. Nimrod, uh, he's the, 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 the king who threw Avraham Avinu into the fire. Nimrod was the one who started the whole movement after the flood about b building the, the tower. Nimrod survived the, the flood. And there are two versions that are saying that one version said because he was such a giant and such a strong man, he actually held the, the ark yes. on the outside and he yes. was somehow able to survive it. Which that opinion is not so... Uh, it doesn't make so much sense because we know that the water of the flood was boiling hot water and a man cannot survive it. But the other opinion says that Nimrod just ran away to the land of Israel because he know that there wasn't a flood in Israel. And the flood was all over the world, but it didn't occur in the land of Israel. So there's many reasons why we know why we celebrate the, the two days outside of Israel. But mystically, Israel is much more powerful. So it doesn't need two days, mm -hmm. mystically and, yes. and spiritually. One day is enough. Yes. So what you get outside or anywhere in the world for two days, in Israel you do it in one day. And it's usually much more powerful even than the two yes. days out in the diaspora. Yes. So I just wanted to add that, that Israel is just much, much more spiritually high. And therefore we only need one day. And Baruch Hashem, it's unbelievable. And I wish everybody, all the Jews, should enjoy this unbelievable power. Amen. And let's just go to our first ad break and we'll be back with you now. You've seen them on the History Channel and now they are on your radio. Shirley MacLaine. I met her when she came to Sun City many years ago. She must be 100. On Wednesday, it seems to be hump day. Wednesday is not a humping day, it's a hump day, yes. Pond stars South Africa. There's a lot of things saying about diamond. Diamonds are forever. Diamonds are girl best friends. Diamonds are men worst enemy. <laughs> but you know that Chuck Norris cut an onion, the yeah. onion cries. You know that. <laughs> you know Chuck Norris once killed a man twice. Join Roy and his team for honest, irreverent, and entertaining radio every Wednesday at 6 p.m. From the top to music, from Johannesburg to Israel, to business, this is 101.9 High FM. Good morning and welcome to the Cabana Show, Body, Mind and Soul of Imona. And this morning at Salon Revalon Anava and myself, um, hosting the show here live in, from Svat, and Alon has just given an amazing um, insights into the, the why we have one day 
for all the Chagim except it's um, Rosh, uh, Rosh Hashanah, where we yeah. do um, have two days. And um, thank you so much, Alon. And as uh, I was introducing the show, we were going to uh, delve a little bit into the the aspects of the how the the, the history the uh, the how uh, Sfat, um, being the the second holiest city in uh, the whole of Eretz Yisrael gained its its gi giganticism in terms of the Makobals, the, the Kabbalists that came here and that are buried here. It, you, you, as you come here, you, you, can, you can just feel it. You can't describe it, but you can just feel it. So the history of Tzfat, it starts uh, almost in the beginning of the world. Uh, Tzfat is well known that it's uh, uh, located in the north of Israel. Uh, it's the tallest city in Israel. There are a few more mountains that are higher than the, the mountain where Tzfat is sitting on, Mount Hebron and a few more, but it's the highest point in Israel that people live on. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, we are 900 meters over uh, sea level. I'm not 100%, wow. but we're about 900 meters over sea level, and it's one of the cities that is surrounded by mountains. So even according to Halakha, we don't need a, what's called the Eruv in the city yes. because we are secluded and we're oh. surrounded by mountains. There is an Eruv in Tzfat, but yes. even according to Halakha, we don't need an Eruv here. Eruv is allowing us to carry on Shabbat. Yes. So Tzfat starts by being elevated, by being on the top and being on the highest point in, in Eretz Israel. But... Tzfat, you can talk about probably for five shows, and we'll never, never <laughs> finish it. But uh, the history of Tzfat starts right after the flood. We mentioned before the flood. And just a few points in history about, about uh, Tzfat is that in the book of Shoftim, of Judges, when the land was divided to the tribes, then the tribe of Naphtali got the area of Tzfat which actually the tribe of Issachar was considered the learned one. But this is what history says, that Tzfat was the, in the, the portion with the tribe of Naphtali got. And in the, in the Talmud, in the Yerushalmi Talmud, it's talking about that Tzfat is one of the five cities that they would light the bonfires to let the other cities know about Rosh Chodesh. Wow. Wow. So what I said before, yes. that the, the, the Sanhedrin, the, the Beitin, the court would decree when would be the Rosh Chodesh, and one of the ways that they used to, to let uh, other cities know that uh, there were five cities that would light on their mount, on their hilltops, fire, and the smoke and the fire would be a signal to the next city. They stopped that at some point because there were a group of people that wanted to make uh, trouble, and they would light fire on the wrong days. So that's why they start sending messages. So Svat was one of these five cities. But to, to kind of see a few hints why Tzfat became such a learning center is that right after the flood, the son of Noah, Noah had already three sons, Shem, Ham, and Yefet, and we are descendants of Shem. Right after the flood, they had to populate the world, and Shem located himself in the city of Tzfat. And he took his son, Ever, and they started the first yeshiva uh, in the history of the world, and it's right around the corner from where we live. <laughs> it's about 50 meters from us right now as we so speak. <laughs> and this is the famous yeshiva that all the forefathers learned there. Avraham Avinu was there, Yitzchak and Yaakov. That's the yeshiva that when Avraham Avinu left Haran, then he, he, he got to Shem and Ever, and he studied there for years, as we can see in the Torah. The Torah is talking about Avraham Avinu when he was born, and then it jumps forward 75 years. So in those 75 years, there was a very long period that Avraham Avinu left Haran, and he, he came to Tzfat, to Shem and Ever to learn. Later on, we see in the Torah when Yaakov Avinu had to run away, he also went to, Haran, to, to Tzfat for 14 years to study by Shem and Ever. And literally 50 meters from where we live, you can go and visit the cave. Yes. And there's a, there's a yeshiva there now, there's a synagogue there now, but there's the actual cave that we believe that that's the cave that they really sat and learned Torah. 
And we know that all the teachings of Kabbalah came from Shem and Ever, because the core of Kabbalah, the, the original teaching, came from Adam Arishon. Adam Arishon was the first Mekubal, because he saw the Kadosh Baruch Hu. He, he was the first student. Not only that, before they sinned, they had the ability to see, to see the power and the revelation of God. Later on, after they sinned, that they went down in their level, and they, they became physical like us. Not exactly like us. Even when the Adam Arishon became physical, he was much in a much higher level than us. But before he sinned, he literally saw the godly power that enlivens the world. We know how Adam Arishon used to, Kadosh uh, Baruch used to bring to him all the animals, and he named them, and he named everything because he saw the godly power that's enlivening the animal, and he said, "Okay, uh, this would be uh, called a, a lion. This will be a giraffe, and so forth." So Adam Arishon. He got all the original information of Kabbalah. The first Kabbalah book that is known to us is called Sefer Yetzirah. That it's, uh, it's connected more to Avraham Avinu. It says that Avraham Avinu actually compiled it, but the information he actually got from Adam Arishon, that passed it to his son, that passed it to, to, to Noach, and so forth, till it came to Avraham Avinu, that came to the yeshiva of Shem and Ever. It says that the, the, the second hand was Shet. Shet was one of the uh, Adam's sons. So Adam Arishon already passed over a lot of Kabbalah information uh, through the first uh, 2,000 years. So the first Kabbalistic yeshiva is the, the yeshiva of Shem and Ever that is right here in Sfat. And for thousands of years, you know, Israel, you know, was constantly uh, uh, occupied and not occupied. But the next period that it's talking about the city of Tzvat, it's at the time of the Talmud. And we see that the, the greatest Tana that started the, the, the next era of Kabbalah is Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. He actually didn't live in Tzvat, he lived in, uh, in Meron, which is about nine kilometers from us. Uh, Ariel, it's maybe three or four kilometers. It's nine kilometers because you're going through the winding mountains. But from our house, our entire view is Mount Meron, and we see directly into uh, the cave of, of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. So Ariel, I think it's about maybe three to five kilometers from us, which is very, very close. Yes. So it's known that the, the, the Ratzadik, he chooses where to be buried, because he knows that he, that will be the, the place where he rests forever till Mashiach comes. And that's going to be the, the gate of, of the heavens, the channel where he's going from the higher world to the lower world. It says in the Zohar that the tzaddikim are greater in their death than they're, when they're alive, meaning that when they're alive, they're huge, they're giants, but they're limited to their body. So they can only do, a, you know, they're very limited with what they can do. But once they leave this world, they're much greater because they don't have a body. And they can visit the higher world, they come down to the lower world, and so forth. So we definitely know that the tzaddikim, the great tzaddikim, their souls are, you know, visiting this world constantly. So the place where the tzaddik, where the righteous man or woman chooses to be buried, it's by default, it's a holy place. Mm -hmm. The Arizal, who we're going to talk about the whole era of the, the, of the Arizal, he says that the, there are four holy cities in Israel, Jerusalem, Beit Leche, eh, 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 Hebron, Tveria, and Tzfat, which they correspond to each one of the four elements that create the world, the spiritual and the physical world. Yerushalayim is fire, and we see that the, the hint for that, they used to do the sacrifices in Yerushalayim. Hebron is, is compared to Afar, to uh, earth. We see that the, the cave, the Marat Machpela, is, is there, where all the Adam and Chava are buried there, Avram and Sarah are buried there, all the forefathers except Rachel, and Tveria is the third holy city, and this corresponds to water, to the element of water, and we see that they have the Kineret there, and the fourth city is Tzfat, which corresponds to the element of air. The Arizal says that the four, that the four uh, holy cities are, are these ones, and Arizal explains that all year round, and it never left, that the Shekhinah, the, the godly presence, is hovering over Tzfat. 
And if a, a, a source like the Rizal says that, it means that it's still valid. And it means that the Holy Presence, Mamash the Shechina, the same way that it's shining over Yerushalayim, it's shining the exact same power of Tzfat. Okay, we're just going to go to our next ad break and we'll be back with you now. Picture this. You are in Israel. You get into a taxi. Taxi! The radio comes on. בקצב היום, תוכנית המוזיקה היהודית הגדולה בעולם. The Beat of the Day, the world's largest Jewish music program. Now, we bring you the experience right here from sunny South Africa on 101.9 High FM. בקצב היום, The Beat of the Day, weeknights at 8 p.m. An all-Hebrew show straight from Israel, where you will hear the latest Jewish music from around the world. 101.9 High FM. 101.9 megahertz of the latest Jewish music. Repeats weekdays at 6 a.m. The best part of your day. At the heart of your community. All the talk, all the music, all the news. Chai FM. Good morning and welcome to the Cabana Show, Body, Mind and Soul, Lobby Muna, and we are live from Svat. And I've just got a message here that I just want to read out from Chaim. Shalom, Cabana and Alon. Thank you for responding to my email and um, I'm making Aliyah in February. I'm also glad to have got to talk from, that's from Chaim. So obviously you got to, to speak to him, which is wonder, absolutely wonderful. Thank you, Chaim, for the message. So Alon, just before the break, you were speaking about the, um, the, the four cities in uh, Eretz Israel and corresponding to the elements and the, how they all do correspond to the elements and then carry on from there. So, <clears throat> so we, already, we already know, based on the teachings of Kabbalah, that, that these four holy cities correspond to the four elements that were, that were used to create the world and even the spiritual world. So Tzfat was always considering the element of air, the element of spirituality, and it was always chosen to be the center of learning. Why? We don't know. It's almost like saying, why was Yerushalayim chosen to be the place where the Holy Temple will be? Because that's where God chose it to be. But we see already from history that in the beginning, like we said, Shem and Evel, they came to Tzfat. They chose to, to, to inhabit the place and populate the place and be the first learning center in the world. And might, one might say the first Kabbalah center in the world because they were only teaching Kabbalah. They didn't have anything else then. Then Avraham Avinu came here and Yaakov Avinu came. And then with the generations for a certain a, a period of time, there was nobody here. And then came here the great Tana of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai that he's the first one who really started teaching the, the mysticism of the Torah. For many years, he wasn't even teaching. He was only teaching his students. Uh, for thousands of years, the Zohar was not even revealed. To be more exact, exact 1,500 years from the time of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai till the Arizal. We know even the Arizal himself that came to Tzfat didn't have the actual book of Zohar. He knew about it, he had script, scripts of it, but he didn't actually have it. But Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai also chose this place to be his place of burial. So we see from all this that Tzfat has a, a, a magnet has some type of magnetic force specifically for the teaching of the spiritual and mystical part of the Torah. Again, why we don't know, it's almost like asking certain questions, why, why, why uh, 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 anything that God chooses. But uh, obviously that our, our, our history and the pillars of our Torah chose this place. I mean, anyone who just steps foot here can feel yes. that the, the magnetic power, this yes. force here is unbelievable. Yes. And around the, the 16th century, before that, the Israel was not uh, really populated by Jews. But after the Spanish Inquisition and then the deportation of all the Jews from that area, the, the, most of the rabbis of that area came to Tzfat. And it started with the generation of uh, Maran of Yosef Karo and Moshe, Rabbi Moshe Kordevora, who was known as the Ramak. 
and many more other tzaddikim, the Al Sheikh, the Abu Hav, who sent here his students. Many tzaddikim came to this city to inhabit this city. Uh, th there's no reason why they came to here. I believe that in their uh, spiritual level, they knew that this is a very high and spiritual uh, city. More than that, uh, at the time, like now we don't have this problem, but at the time, it, elevated cities were considered guarded cities and the cities that they won't be attacked, mm -hmm. cities that there's not going to be wars so fast against them. I'm sure they had their also their physical calculations, but yeah. spiritually I know that they came here because up until today, people who want to write books, they come here for three, four months and it's quiet here, there's no distractions here, the spiritual air here is unbelievable. I have a friend who wrote already seven books of course, the books that have to do with the teachings of Torah. And every time he, he wants to write a book, he comes to Tzfat for three, four months. And he rents himself a small apartment. And he sits here for a couple of months to write his books. And the air, the air here is unbelievably crisp and, and clear. And, and I see for myself that when I learn here, the, the ability to absorb is unbelievable. So we can see why these, these sages decided to come to here. But around the end of the 16th century, started, Tzfat started becoming a center, a learning center. And especially for the mysticism of the Torah. And it started with the Ramak. Ramak is the acronym of Rabbi Moshe Kordevora, who was known to be the, the great Rebbe of the generation who later on became the Rebbe of the Arizal. I keep mentioning the Arizal in case any one of the listeners doesn't know who I'm talking about. His name is Yitzchak Luria, Rabbi Yitzchak Luria. The Ari is an is a acronym of his name, Ashkenazi Rabbi Yitzchak. So his last name is Luria, and he is the pillar of the, the Kabbalistic era of the 16th century. Most of the Kabbalah books that came after that era is from his teachings. He actually didn't write any books, he just had his, his scripts and his students, that the main one is Rabbi Chaim Vital, he wrote most of his books. And Arizal was known to be an unbelievable neshama and he started his life off in Yerushalayim and then after his father died when he was very young, his mother and him left to Egypt to his uncle and he would go every day to the river and uh, Eliyahu Navi, Elijah, would appear to him and would teach him the secrets of Kabbalah. At some point he told him that he has to go to Tzfat to, to find certain individuals. He met the Ramak and the Rabbi Chaim Vital and then he made his way up to Tzfat and he was only 36 at the time. And when he came, he went to the Rebbe of the generation, who was the Ramak, who has unbelievable uh, depth of teachings of Kabbalah, and, and wrote several Kabbalah books. And at the time when he came, he told him that uh, he was sent to him. Of course, the Ramak you know, thought, okay, who's this young boy coming here to try to, to impress me? But very soon, the Rizal uh, proved himself to be uh, something uh, not ordinary. Yes. And at some point, he went to Rabbi Chaim Vital, who was later became his student, and he told him that he was sent from Shammai, from the heavens, to come and teach him. Uh, imagine now, a 36-year-old uh, yeshiva bacher comes to one of the pillars of the generation and tells him, I was sent to teach you. Needless to say, Rabbi Chaim Vital thought it's a joke, and he started questioning him and giving him all sorts of hard questions. And every question that he gave, the Arizal answered him depth of, over depth and unbelievable answers. Very quickly, he noticed that this is not some uh, regular yeshiva bachar, and right away he told him, I want you to teach me everything. So the Rizal took Rabbi Chaim Vital to the Kineret, to the river uh, that, right, that is right, on the, uh, right next to Tveria and is very close to Tzfat. And we know that the well of Miriam is somewhere there. We don't know where, but the well of Miriam is there. And the Rizal gave Rabbi Chaim Vital one cup of the water from the well of Miriam. And his well springs of knowledge opened and, they, and he taught him the depth of the teachings 
of the mysticism and Kabbalah. Unfortunately, we don't know where that well is. If, if not, we would go and drink there every day. But uh, that's the time that the Arizal was here. And most of the Kabbalah teachings that we have right now comes from the Arizal. I mean, we have a few Kabbalah books like the Sefer Yetzira, and we have the Zohar, and there's teachings from the Ramchal and, 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 and the Maharal. There's many different types of Kabbalah teachings and mysticism. But it kind of all funneled into the era of the Arizal, and most of the Kabbalistic teachings, it's called the, 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 the Luria, the, Kabbal, the Kabbalistic teachings of Luria, because it came from him. There are many types of other Kabbalah, but the, the processes of, of, of the Arizal, which started from his Talmidim, his disciples, one of them is Rabbi Chaim Vital, it went down through the Achiyah Shiloni, and then to the Baal Shem Tov, and then from the Baal Shem Tov, to all his students, starting from the Magid from Azrij down to all the the seven students that are known, like Rabbi Nachman from Breslev, the Alter Rebbe from Chabad, the Ismach Moshe from Satmer, and so forth, the Beitzchak from Berdijov, and they started the whole Hasidic movement, which all the Hasidic teachings is based on the teachings of Kabbalah of the Rizal. So I keep mentioning the Rizal all the time, but he's uh, the, the main pillar in the teachings of Kabbalah, and most of the Hasidic teachings is based on his teachings. Yes. And he decided to sit himself himself here in Svats. Needless to say, he's also buried here. And about 150 meters from us is the, the, the cemetery where you can f easily find here about 500 graves of Tzadikim, uh, starting from the Rizal himself, which right next to him is his son. And then is Rabbi Moshe El Kabetz, who's known as an, the author of the song Lecha Dodi, that we sing every Shabbat. In front of him is the Ramak, his Rebbe, Rabbi, Rabbi Moshe Kordevora, is also the, also the Radbaz is here, who was once one of the pillars of the generation. And then you go maybe 30 meters down, and is Maran Yosef Karo, who wrote the Shulchan Aruch, and next to him the Abu Hav, and then the Sheikh, and it goes on and on. And yes. you can spend days yes. next to all these graves. At the time, even though it was a, it was a source of the mystical uh, teachings of, of the Torah, at the same time also the, the, the uh, foundation of oral Torah was based here. The, the Maran Bet Yosef who wrote the Shulchan Aruch, Yosef Karo. All these rabbis, they all originated from the area of Spain. You can even see their names, Caro and Cordevo, and all the, the, these Spanish names. They all moved themselves over here. So not only the teachings of mysticism started in Sfat, also the oral Torah was brought down through Yosef Caro and written the Shulchan Aruch. And it's unbelievable because you walk around the streets here of the old city and every... 10 meters is a different synagogue of one of these sages. Yes. Like you can pray whenever you want in yes. the shul of Yosef Karo, of the Arizal, of the, of the uh, Al Sheikh. Just now on Shavuot, we, we, we had a little uh, a shiur on the night of Shavuot. Later on, the men, we sat together and we read the tikkun. Around 4.20 in the morning, we went to the mikveh of the yes, Arizal, which we're going to talk. Uh, Bezad Hashem will have yes. a few minutes to just talk about yes. the mikveh of the Arizal. So we all went there to the mikveh four o'clock in the morning. It's only about 400 steps to go down the hill and into the cemetery where the mikveh is. And we all dipped in this unbelievable mikveh. And right after that, we dis you know, everybody was debating which shul should we go to. <laughs> so it's known that one of the shuls here is called the Abu Hav. This is known, uh, 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 named after the great uh, uh, teacher, Yitzhak Abu Hav who actually never merited to come to Tzfat, but he sent his students to Tzfat, and they, he has a synagogue here, and in the synagogue is the oldest Torah book in, in the world, and there are two Torah books. One of them was written by the Rizal, and one of them was written by the uh, Itzhak Abu Hav, and we had the Zchut on, on the holiday of Shavuot, five o'clock in the morning, we prayed an early Shacharit, and we had the merit that they opened the ark once a year to take out these books. Yes. And we read out of the Torah from the Holy Book oh. of the Rizal and the wow. Holy Book of the uh, Abu Hav, wow. which was an unbelievable experience. Yes. I mean, for all my life of being religious was in yes. the, the United States, and it's so not holy. Yes. 
Yes. And here I am in the city of Tzfat, yes. standing in a 500-year-old shul, <laughs> which if you're interested to see how it looks, just go to Google and Google Abu Hab shul in Tzfat. Yes. There's unbelievable pictures. It's, it's, it was a little bit damaged by the, the earthquakes in the, in, in, that hit Tzfat, but it's restored and, and it's unbelievable. And the, the, the spirituality and the holiness just to go to the mikveh at four in the morning and then go climb up to go to the shul. I'm assuming there was a couple hundred people there. The energy was not normal. Yes. And then they opened the ark that is locked the entire year and taking out 500 year old book of Sefer Torah that Ari Zal wrote. Just looking at it and just touching it is unbelievable experience. You don't get it anywhere else. No, no. This is only available in the land of Eretz Israel. <laughs> And needless to say that the experience was beyond, beyond amazing. Yes. And I had a lot of guests that, that tagged along. Yes. Some guests came from, from the United States. Some guests came from different places. Yes. Needless to say, the experience was unbelievable. But the, in the little alleys of Tzfat, it's just unbelievable. You, you're walking in the alleys and you feel that you're 500 years in, back in time. Yes. Everything is, is, is exactly how it was, synagogues from 500 years ago, and just knowing that these pillars of our Torah lived here and, and learned here, it's unbelievable. And, and walked here, and it's like being in a time machine. Um, I, I often get a sense of a past, present, and future all wrapped up in one in, in, a, split, in a split second. And it's... it's, um, it's yeah, it's an experience that is unbelievable to actually describe. Probably poetry would do the, the best justice to it, if, if any justice could be done to it. I just want to add something, my, please God, my, my future son-in-law that went with you um, to uh, the, the mikvah of the Ari. The following day, um, so after that experience, he was speechless for the entire day. He could not talk. And I just watched his face. I just watched his facial expressions of um, emotion after emotion after emotion, experience after experience, almost um, biblical, going across his face. And um, probably in, in his later years, he will have the words to describe a little bit of what he actually experienced. He was like a transformed person. I saw and saw in him. Yes, and he, you know, he, he kept saying, you know, I haven't been to a mikvah before. He's a he's a young boy, and of 23, and so he's he put it down to the fact that he hadn't been to a mikvah before, but it was it was far more than that. Far more uh, things happened to him. And you, you saw that. I definitely saw the the mikveh here of the Ari is is it's one of the the, the wonders of the universe, yes. one might say. Yes. And for the viewers, the listeners who want to see what we're talking about, just go to Google and do the Ari Zal mikveh in Tzfat. There are enough pictures and videos showing it. But when I came first time to Israel, I, I, my, my history in a nutshell that is I grew up in Israel. Yes. And I left Israel when I was 23, totally secular, never said one word of Torah that came out of my mouth. And when I was 27, I had a near-death experience that caused me to become religious just by seeing the truth. And I always, everybody kept telling me, you have to go to Tzfat, this, this is right, you're up your alley. Yes. And five years ago, when we first came to Tzfat, the first time, then uh, we, we, we were, needless to say, we were stunned by the city. And that night, I, I don't go to sleep early. I don't like going to sleep early. I find sleeping a waste of time. <laughs> so around two o'clock in the morning, I went to sleep. And I never slept like this in my life. I literally felt that I'm hovering over the bed. Yes. And for two hours, I knew I was asleep, but I wasn't asleep. I was up. Yes. And I, I, at 4 o'clock in the morning, I got out of bed and I was like, what's going on in this city? Something's very weird in this city. I was literally awake while, and I knew I was sleeping. So I, I left the, the hotel where we stayed and I went down to the mikveh of the Rizal at 4 o'clock in the morning. 
And after that, I went to a little uh, tour and with all the graves and prayed. And then I went to pray Shacharit. And when I came home, I told my wife, something is, this place is not normal. Yes. And Baruch Hashem, Hashem had the, the, the kindness to bring us back here after five years to live here. But the Mikvah of the Rizal, first of all, it's in a cave. Yes. And you can't really see it in the pictures. Even if you go on Google and you Google it, you're not going to see it from the pictures. No. But you go in a cave. Yes. And the Mikvah of the Rizal, nobody know, knows where the water is coming from. Yes. This is the original, the most highest level Mikveh possible. Because mikveh can be uh, rainwater that is captured, and then there's a whole process mm. how to make it a kosher mikveh. Of course, uh, you know, there's different laws how an ocean can be a mikveh, mm. uh, a river, but a live wellspring, this is the, the highest, uh, purest level of a mikveh. And this is the mikveh of the Rizal, and nobody knows where the water is coming from. In the cave, there's a crack in the wall that if you bend and you come with a flashlight, I actually took once a video of it. If you bend very, like, real low and you look into the crack, you see where the water is coming from. Yes. Like, I mean, it's coming from the wall. Nobody yes. really knows where it's coming from. The water is so pure, people come with their, with their bottles to, live, to fill it up, and you never tasted such sweet water. And the mikveh, people, hundreds of people dip there. It's crystal clear. Yes. There's no filters there. There's nothing there. And... First of all, needless to say, it's free. It's ice cold. It's yes. freezing, freezing cold yes. mikveh, which is unbelievable. And when you go in, the sensation is not normal because you're going into ice, freezing mikveh, <laughs> and I feel it. I don't know about other people. After 30 seconds to a minute in the mikveh, up until my knees, it feels like warm water, yes. like like a, you're in a jacuzzi or something, yes. and. Really, nobody really knows where the water is coming from. We know it's coming from some wellspring, but nobody really knows where. The story is that Darizal came there, and the water just started coming towards him. Darizal gave a promise that, that whoever will dip in his mikveh is guaranteed to leave this world with doing tshuva. Yeah. Now, I didn't say enough about Darizal. Maybe Bezrat Hashem one, one time will dedicate some more time just to talking to him. I keep saying Arizal, Arizal. This is not a normal man that we can uh, mm -hmm. uh, say, okay, it's a great yes, rabbi. Yes, yes. He was known to have one of the most highest level of what's called Ruach HaKodesh. Ruach HaKodesh is not, not exactly Holy Spirit, but it's a, a, a power of, of prophecy. Yes. But not only that, Ruach HaKodesh is, is a high level of, of spirituality that he literally saw through walls. He would look at a person, he would see all his reincarnations, uh, he would walk, the reason why we know all the graves of all the sages yes. around here yes. and around Tzfat in the radius of 30 kilometers, most of the sages are buried. Yes. Like if you go to, to the area of Tveria, the, the, there are th hundreds, mm -hmm. Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Meir Balanes, the Ramchal, the Rambam, anywhere you go in the north, there's hundreds if not thousands of all the graves. Now, nobody knew where they are. The Rizal would walk and he would hear the whispering from the grave and said, oh, here is buried Rabbi Yossi Aglili and here is buried the Tana such and such. He would listen and he would hear their talking. That's how we know where the graves are. Wow. And the Rizal was such a, such a giant that, you know, the giants of the generation, like Yosef Karo, the Ramak, Rabbi Chaim Vital, there were dwarfs next to him. Mm. And every person who wanted to come to him, he had a, a, an angel coming to him and telling him, this person is about to come. This is yes. the answer you should give him. Yes. So the Rizal is, is, is an unbelievable level. We, don't, we can't even relate to the level of the Rizal that what we have from his teachings is not even a fraction of what he actually really wrote because he would write his scripts and then burn them because he didn't want anybody to find it. He said, if somebody would find it, they, yes. they, they would might use it the wrong way. Yes. And what we have from his scripts is yes. literally maybe not even 1% of what he actually really wrote. Wow. And he didn't want people to see what he's writing. Yes. Well, he's, the stories of the Rizal, the phenomenal stories of unbelievable depth, of, of, of it's unbelievable, literally unbelievable. So he, he, uh, uh, I don't know if he, he literally built a mikveh, but the story is that the water actually rose to him. And exactly like you said, people go to this mikveh, they change, they're changed for life. Yes. Literally changed for life. 
I can quite well believe that. We're just going to go to our next break and we'll be back with you now. Good morning Good and morning. welcome to the Cabana Show, Body, Mind, Mind and Soul. Soul. And I have the absolute privilege, privilege sitting next to me, Rabbi Lon Anava. And uh, Alon has been sharing with us the, uh, the history of Sfat and speaking a lot about the mikveh of the Arizal. And as he said earlier on that, we could speak uh, show upon show upon show just to touch the surface of what the Ariza brought to our physical earth. And just in the break, we were talking about the, 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 the absolute mind-bogglingness of being able to go to the, uh, the Arizal's the Ari mikveh every single day, that you have that privilege. And, 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 and so many more um, of the Makobalim that are that lived here in Sfat, that contributed towards Sfat. Uh, and just so we don't have much time, but just in, in the next um, seven minutes that we've got to wrap up, what are the, the, the really um, powerful uh, th thoughts that come to your mind just to share with the listeners? And please, God, we will do more shows on the, the, the RE. Well, there's... The, the, the... It's almost almost impossible to summarize things so fast, yes. but I can share my, my personal experience that when I go to, you, to Jerusalem, you literally feel the fire there. And when people come and move to Israel, okay, people populate in big, big cities, but a lot of people, they, they look for a city that, that really relates to the element of their soul because our soul is built from these four elements and one of the elements is always dominating and then there's one element that is the least dominating and another two that are kind of equal and people that their element of fire is dominating they'll be drawn to Yerushalayim and people who their element of air is dominating will be drawn to Tzfat and it says in the Talmud in the Gemara that the air of Eretz Israel of the land of Israel makes you smarter and you really feel it here. Yes. You really feel that the air here is unbelievable. And I can tell from my own experience that it, right now, sunrise is about 4.30. Yes. 4.30, yes. it's when the, star, the, star, the sky is, is turning to blue. Yes. And so from 4.30 to 5.20, I, I sit on my porch. And my porch is, is, I feel like the most luckiest man in the world because God brought me to Eretz Israel and placed me on the top hill of Tzfat, yes. which within a five-minute walk, I'm everywhere. And like I said, I'm literally 50 meters from Shem and Ever, and you can feel the, the, the waves coming from there. And I'm a, a 10-minute walk down to the cemetery. And I know it sounds scary, a cemetery, but this is a cemetery of holy people. And my view is Mount Meron, and I'm looking right at Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. And, and I sit on my porch and I learn, and at about 4.30 in the morning to 5.20, the light that you see is not a normal light. Yes. It's yes. a total different light yes. that you can only see it in Israel. And, yes. and, and I know, and I'm yes. saying it from experience, because I, before I became religious, I traveled for years around the world. There's not one place in the world that my foot didn't step there. And I traveled in the Far East for, for a long time, and in Australia, my, well, my mom is Australian, so I went there a long time, and North America, South America, I traveled everywhere. There's not such a light, in, in, even in Israel, yes. this, it's this deep, deep blue light yes. that it, it's as if there's a different dimension here. It's yes. not the dimension that it we is. see, it has a, an extra dimension here. And, and I feel, I can say for myself, that I feel here in Tzfat that literally every word you, of Torah you say here is like 500 million words of Torah anywhere else. Yes. And the depth of the learning here is unbelievable. Yes. And not only, not, not for no reason, Shem and Ever came here to start a yeshiva, and then Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai came here to learn, and then the, all the Mekubalim came here. And now you see that Tzfat is the capital of spiritual teachings of the world. There are numerous yeshivas, numerous seminaries, unbelievable amount of people all come here to, 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 to get a little bite out of this spiritual city. It's a very small city, 
Baruch Hashem, uh, even though we're starting to populate it lately, <laughs> but uh, the place here is, is a, a magnetic field of holiness. And Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai says that when Mashiach is going to come, he's going to come through Tzfat first. Before he goes to Yerushalayim, he's coming through Tzfat. There's an alley. There's one of the alleys here. It's called the alley of Mashiach. That there was a certain lady who used to sit there every day and wait for him to come. And if we have a promise from the Tana, from the sage Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, it means Mashiach is coming through Tzfat on his way to Yerushalayim. And if Mashiach oh, okay. is choosing to come through the city, it just goes to show to you the, 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 how special this city is. I definitely urge anyone to first go online and, and see these beautiful sites. Mm-hmm. Uh, I believe there's many websites and pictures and videos to see. And the, the, the earliest opportunity you can, you have to come and visit here. Mm-hmm. It's an unbelievable city. And Bezrat Hashem, you know, with the teachings of the Torah that's coming out of uh, this holy city, they should, uh, we should merit that it will bring the coming of Mashiach much, much faster. Bezrat Hashem then will learn the ultimate mysticism of the Torah when Mashiach is going to come. It says a new Torah is going to come with him. He's going to teach us the depth of the Torah. We know that simple things that seem to us like very mundane and basic laws in the oral law We'll see the pearls and their depth in it. Bezad Hashem, it should happen very, very soon. Amen to that. And uh, I, I know it's opening up a, a, a little bit of a, of a different subject, but it is linked. And I said to your, to your wife, Devorah, that the female energy here in Sfat is just, is actually mind blowing. The, 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 the power of the feminine energy and one of the predictions of the Mashiach's arrival is that the, the energy of the feminine is going to, to arise. And it's, it's, it's so palpable here, and it's so acceptable here, it is so beautiful here. It, is, it, it blends in with everything else that is happening in Svat. And also just my experience of Svat is it's like living living in the clouds. It's like it's not living on this earth. It's actually I don't feel like I'm part of this earth. I feel if I, I travel um, a, a little bit away from Svat, I'm going a little bit down in, into physicality, and th- that sometimes is, is a little bit scary for me. I'm I'm much more comfortable in the spiritual areas of this world. Sometimes I, I do need to put my feet on the ground. However, th- that's my experience. And so please go along that we will do many, many more shows on um, sharing with the listeners your vast knowledge of, uh, of Sfat, of the Arizal, of the, uh, what's happening. Because we, one of the things we wanted to talk about today was the um, opening up a, a, a seminary here for ladies over 40. So anybody wanting to email Alon or myself or to just uh, uh, email the studio, the uh, um, on-air email line, on-air at chaifm.com, Gavanna Friedman at chai, and uh, Alon, www.alonanava.com or uh, alonanava.com. And any questions that you do have, Ladies, the doors open, and um, uh, you know, that, that seems to be the show for today. Just a long, a, a quick word. Yes, you mentioned about the learning center. Bezrat Hashem, maybe we'll talk about it uh, in one of the uh, future shows. But we are looking for a place mm. to start here, a, a learning center for ladies. Mm. You said 40 and up. I mean, we'll accept somebody who's 39. <laughs> but the point is to, to there is no such a learning center in the world for ladies who are married and they want to learn Torah, that they can come for a week or two. And there's not any place in the world for older ladies, whether they're divorced, widowed, single. And, and I have hundreds of students, yeah. hundreds, literally hundreds of students of women who are over the age of 40. The majority of them are either single 
for whatever circumstance, or they're married and they just can't leave their home to go and study, and they become religious, they become more observant, and they don't know where to go. They don't have where to go, because they don't, they, they don't want to go to a, a seminary with 17-year-old or 22-year-old. So this is the goal right now. We're working very hard to find uh, a building that will allow us to, to start the center, Mezad Hashem, Hashem will help. We will find a building very soon. We found something, but it didn't work out. And once once we establish that, of course, the, the studies will be local. But we're planning to stream all the the, the, the classes. They're all going to be live. It's going to be literally a learning center that women can come from all over the world, whether it's for a week or for a year. We'll accommodate them with, with the sleeping arrangements and food. And most important the unbelievable wellsprings of knowledge of the Torah that will, that will allow... We have the first group of women coming at the end of August. We still don't have this, the actual center, but we have the first group of women coming from, from uh, the United States. They're all in their area of their 50s, give or take. Maybe some older, some younger. They're coming here for 10 days. They're going to be sleeping in Tzvat and eating in Tzvat, and they're going to be spending most of their day with me which uh, we're going to be praying, we're going to be learning, we're going to be traveling, we're going to go to all sorts of beautiful sites. But the main point is to have, a lot of them are married, they're just having a 10-day marathon of tasting spirituality and holiness in Torah in the most holiest place in the world and in the capital of Torah. Mezad Hashem will be able to establish a big learning center, it's just now depending on finding the building. This is the only thing that's stopping us right now. Mezad Hashem, that's going to happen very soon. But hopefully we'll be able to open the first, uh, the first and only so far learning center for women in the world in the land of Israel, which we'll talk about maybe another time, but the importance of why specifically women. The women are more important than the men. And you said here the feminine part of, of Tzfat, then, then this is a very long explanation, but we'll talk about it at another time, how Tzfat corresponds to the first hey of the name of Yudke Vavke, and this is called Bina, and this is what's called in Kabbalah the Ima Ila'a, the higher level mother. So that's why you feel this feminine energy here. Yeah. Bezad Hashem, we should talk about it in the next coming uh, shows. Okay. okay. Thank you so much, Alon. Thank you so, so much for being with me this morning. And with that, it just remains for me to say to have the most beautiful Wednesday, the most beautiful rest of your week, and the most beautiful, beautiful Shabbos. And from me, from Cabana Friedman, bye bye. We bring the news. We bring the action. We bring it live. This is 101.9 High FM.